So what we've done in the GF is do an impact evaluation of climate change mitigation efforts. And we focused on market change that we wanted to achieve in uh, some of the emerging economies, China, India, Mexico, and Russia. Why? Because we felt that these would have uh, uh, visible um, effects through large projects, through large efforts, and uh, it would be relatively more easy. And it could also provide uh, a learning perspective for countries that have less uh, uh, um, big economies. So the key questions and approach that we asked ourselves were first, uh, to what extent uh, the GF contributed to uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions in uh, uh, emerging economies? And what has been the progress towards market change? Because that makes it lasting. It's not just an intervention, but really the system has changed. And what were the GF contributions in, in, in the process? And what we uh, put central is a theory of change approach to understand the pathways to impact. What is actually supposed to happen and why is it supposed to happen? And then you can focus on what you need to evaluate and where you can put in the respective uh, methods. So we did uh, field research in four countries. We looked at 18 projects and looked at these greenhouse gas emissions at, uh, and mechanisms for change and the barriers. Uh, now, uh, first, of course, there are direct impacts, and uh, we have calculations of this, and you see this on the left side, and you see the countries where, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is just to give you uh, a perspective that, yes, this was, uh, we, we gone into the direct impact issue and started calculating and identifying how much greenhouse gas emissions were actually reduced or averted. So um, this is quite special in itself. It has a, you have all kinds of methodological issues on how you do measure. But even more difficult than the direct impacts are the indirect impacts. And again, they, this is, uh, don't try to read this. It's just to provide you an overview that in all of these cases, we also uh, aim to calculate how many indirect greenhouse gas emission reductions were uh, uh, effectuated. Uh, what do we mean by indirect? Uh, effects that are outside of the range of the project. So you help, uh, let's say, uh, uh, an industry to go over to another technology that has less greenhouse gas emission reductions, but then there are spread out effects uh, other industries are taking this over as well, and before you know it, you have huge uh, uh, in, uh, reductions. But the methodological issues here are even uh, more difficult than for the direct impact. So how do we use then the theory of change, the global environment facility theory of change, to basically look at uh, what we need to uh, research what we need to evaluate in order to see whether the GF has actually contributed. We have actually GF contributions in three different areas. Institutional capacity, and there you will actually, I don't know whether it's readable, but you have uh, policy, legal, and regulatory frameworks there. So there is a normative element in the work of the GF. The GF helps countries to set norms or uh, adopt norms for and, and include these norms in legal frameworks in order to help uh, the country move towards environmentally friendly or, or to move towards global benefits. Uh, there's knowledge and information as a, as a separate group of uh, work, generating knowledge on what works and what doesn't. And there's, there are implementation strategies, and the implementation strategies are demonstration, innovation, things that need to be adopted in order to approve the situation. And it's actually in the implementation strategies that you most often see uh, uh, pilot projects that are, lend themselves for, for example, experimentation, whether this be through randomized controlled trials or quasi-experimental. But what is it all supposed to do? 
actually it is supposed to lead to impact to, on a larger scale. The global environment facility is the global environment facility. It's supposed to not have just local impact, but actually global impact. And so there is supposed to be uh, a process happening that will lead to reductions of, uh, of, of greenhouse gas emissions on a, on a global level that will lead to prevention of global warming. Now, we all know that this is not very successful at the moment. It's actually going in the wrong direction, but uh, uh, that is something that uh, we then... Uh, how is this supposed to change? Well, uh, we need to have transformational change, and um, that happens when you have implementation strategies that can be sustained, mainstreamed, replicated, scaled up, or when you can have market change, and you need to have behavioral change. And that is supposed to then reinforce everything, et cetera, et cetera. And before you know it, you have stress reduction and improved environmental status. And it's very clear that since this is supposed to be at a global level, all countries must participate. It's not just the, the few countries that you, uh, that you have a look at. And, um, and this is, of course, where you come up with uh, phenomena like uh, green growth, and, uh, uh, all the efforts that are ongoing to shift economies in the direction of more sustainable development. And, it's, and you can see that the GF is just one tiny actor in, in that uh, whole range. Yeah. But let's look at the mechanisms to broader adoption. These, uh, I mentioned sustaining, mainstreaming, replication, scaling up. Market change is the one that we try to focus on, uh, especially for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And if we looked at, um, we've looked at the, what all these projects were doing, uh, uh, again, this is just to show you that we went through this. We had uh, uh, a rating for impact of these projects. How are they progressing? towards achieving their own impact objectives? Uh, were sustainability issues involved? Were replication issues involved? Were scaling up issues involved? And yes, we noted that actually projects that had high levels of impact rating also had many of these mechanici uh, mechanisms in included, whereas some of the, of the projects that had uh, almost none of these mechanisms or none had no progress towards impact on their own goals. So when we look at market change, actually we saw four different types of market changes. Improved product quality, more and better suppliers, more demand for sustainable energy technology and practices, so the demand side, and lowered incremental costs so that investments could be made more easily. And 14 out of 18 projects led to change in one or more of these dimensions. And the analysis demonstrated that there are many forms by which projects can improve markets, actually. So the ways to do that are actually uh, uh, des uh, designed specifically for the circumstances in which these, these projects operate. Again, we have uh, uh, just an overview of how these various forms of market improvement were spread out over the projects. And you can see here that they all addressed local circumstances. If uh, the, supply issue was, uh, the, the supply issue was important to change the market, it was addressed. If it wasn't important, but it was really the demand issue, you can see this also in a series of, uh, of countries. Now, we also looked whether we could establish causal linkages between uh, uh, the GF projects and broader adoption of technologies and approaches and strategies. And in 17 of the 18 uh, cases, we could establish uh, uh, this. In, so we have one project there, which apparently had no causal linkage whatsoever between what it was doing and what it was supposed to achieve. So that's... Uh, already uh, an interesting observation. Uh, you don't need to do any randomized controlled trial on such a project. I mean, basically, uh, it stops there. 
But projects demonstrating high progress towards impact are those who really adopted comprehensive uh, approaches to address market barriers. Uh, it's, if, if we go back a few slides, you remember that uh, basically a high rate to, of progress towards impact was linked to doing many of these uh, things. So in these dynamic circumstances, in these complex circumstances, doing more is better. Uh, and um, then we did a counterfactual analysis. Uh, um, because establishing the causal linkages to GF support is not enough to claim a contribution to the process. So counterfactual analysis is often used in attribution, but it is used in contribution as well. So you need to discount rival hypothesis. Other causal links could have taken over if the GF would not have been present. What would have happened in the absence of GF uh, support? And we did two things there. We had a contextual analysis that we tried to do as rigorously as possible. And we had opinions of diverse key informants. So these experts' opinions, if you have expert panels, there are way, uh, ways to make that more rigorous, also pr uh, prevent bias from occurring. So if you look at um, the counterfactual analysis, we found out that uh, 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 first of all, we looked at how likely was it that the activity would have taken place without uh, the, the GF. Uh, um, and in several cases, we found out that uh, the project would not have uh, taken place without the GF. But in most of them, yes, it would have taken place with the GF. But then the question is, would it have taken the same form? And we found two special cases namely that in some cases the projects would have, uh, uh, these activities would have taken place, but slower, later. Uh, the, it would have taken longer to build a coalition to address a certain market barrier. And a second issue that we found in several cases, in two projects actually, uh, the projects would not, the, the initiatives would not have had the same quality would not have been able to include international standards in the situation. So this, uh, uh, basically, what can be attributed to the GEF? First of all, eight uh, activities would not have started without the GEF. So the GEF played a catalytic role. It started up these initiatives, and without the GEF, it would not have started up. Now, in seven cases, the GF has actually speeded up existing progress towards impact. So there, the initiatives would have taken place in any case. But they would, it would have been slower. So what do you get out? The benefit of the GF there is that you speed up the process. And in two cases, there was enhanced quality of the progress towards impact. Now, what are the challenges and priorities that we see out of this for UNEC, for uh, the situations that you are facing? Uh, in the case of the GF, normative and development interventions have well-defined outcome and impact goals. So we can actually, we, we know what the GF wants to achieve in the longer run, and we know how it wants to achieve it. We have established this through the theory of change. We have interacted with, we've done this together with the, the GF itself to identify whether we have the right picture, et cetera, et cetera. But in many cases, uh, this is very difficult for normative work. Um, and I just give the example on, uh, on nuclear safety. If, you, if your aim is to prevent nuclear disasters, the, uh, the, it, it's, you're, you're actually uh, um, trying to do something negative you, in the sense of it, it's something that has its virtual reality rather than reality. So how do you establish that? It's more difficult and you have a, diff a more difficult theory of change that you need to apply and a more difficult analysis. And I think that uh, that's a particular challenge that uh, many of the UN agencies are facing. 
How would you develop a theory of change to address some of the normative issues that you are facing? And the second challenge that we also uh, see, especially with normative uh, and, and uh, catalytic uh, roles like the GF has, uh, the interventions that start up action tend to disappear in longer term e efforts. And I've, I've termed this uh, in uh, earlier presentations, the spark that lights the fire. Uh, if the fire is burning, Nobody uh, uh, is interested in the, uh, the tiny spark that started off the fire anymore. And the tiny spark is not visible anymore. It's disappeared. So you have actually an issue where sustainability may mislead you. It may put you on the wrong foot. If you look at the sustainability of project activities, you will actually say, oh, but the project doesn't exist anymore. It's no longer there. Nobody sustains the project. But that's not necessary anymore. You have had the spark. It's initiated a, a, a broader and more complex and dynamic process. And that's really what you need to look at. And for us, the theory of change approach really allows us to go to these broader dynamic processes and see whether they are happening rather than to uh, follow the old-fashioned idea of we need to follow the money and we need to follow exactly the, whether the kind of mechanisms that were tested out in the intervention are still there. And for us also, in, especially in this evaluation, it was really enriching to see that the counterfactual analysis uh, uh, became an important contribution to the contribution analysis. We better understood how the GEF had actually supported these processes uh, through uh, counterfactual analysis. So that was also an added benefit of this evaluation. Thanks very much.